voice of desire surviving because my sense of what conditions the voice of desire, it's not... Um, I think the degradation of democracy that Plato was concerned with and why the Founding Fathers wanted nothing to do with the word, right? Um, they weren't interested in returning to the polis. They had the fear of direct democracy, of mob rule. We know that Freud had the fear of mob rule. It's because I would like to suggest that they they did not have um, a, a dedication to the dialectic between freedom and constraint upon which true uh, the freedom of speech rests. And that that's where the um, possibilities for the democratization of desire exists. So it's in the commitment to symbolic speech. But it's not the degradation of speech to its lowest common denominator. That's, that threatens the survival of democracy. And it actually threatens our First Amendment. What the more I've read about constitutional jurisprudence, there's it's all over the place. There's a, the failure to hold to any shared, coherent understanding of the value of speech. And so these the decisions made by the courts fluctuate between um, decisions that open up a space for speech and the, and that really shut it down. And we see the winnowing of free speech in the public domain now, which I will again argue is a, 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 um, a way of disembodying or sidelining the sphere of the, the feminine, because free speech in the public domain, in the realm of free assembly, has been massively winnowed. It's no longer, it, it, it's a whole other conversation, but um, so, um, I write a lot in the book about the lines between speech and action and how a lot, if we think in psychoanalytic practice, we usually think that setting restrictions on speech is anathema to psychoanalysis. But in fact, the analyst has all kinds of limitations on their speech. The analyst does not get to just say whatever comes to mind. The analyst's speech is, is, a, is a shared commitment to the patient's speech. That is our responsibility as an analyst. So we, our speech is conditioned. We also don't get to engage in, in hate speech. How could we sustain any ethical um, foothold if we were to use our privilege, our higher role in the hierarchy, to um, to to not stand in the service of enlisting, enfranchising our patient's speech? So I'm. Um, I think, and I think this the question of honesty is it's very interesting the way you frame it because I tend to think of like if we think of Trump as our example as our patient he does say whatever comes to mind it would seem but it, is is there an accountability to honesty and so then the question of what's honest um, that it's true in Freud's um, in Freud's model, the patient says whatever comes to mind and is not to censor. We might say in that sense, Trump is very, very excels at, the, at free association. Um, but we can't have free association in the absence of the transference and the impediments of, of what that means in terms of the unconscious communication and the, and the embodied communication or disembodied communication of our patient. So at a certain point, right, as our patients become more capable of owning, more capable of free association, as it were, um, they might engage in all kinds of, but they, let's say they engage in, um, in hate speech with the analyst. That might occur in the context of anal analysis. We certainly know patients need to use the analytic setting to express their hate, and Winnicott held a very high bar for how we would hear hate and be willing to listen to hate. But ultimately, for a successful analysis, I think the patient, the analyst needs to be able to challenge the patient to bear accountability for their speech and for their speech impact. So. It's not like First Amendment jurisprudence is interested in the speaker's 
freedom. But the but um, critics of a very speaker-dominated First Amendment regime will say, well, we need to consider the whole relational field. It starts to sound like relational psychoanalysis. The speech target, the um, the uh, the listener, the hearer's rights. So. At a certain point, the analyst may say to the patient, um, what does that mean to you to say that you hate me, right? To, or to hate me because you know, I'm Italian or I'm a woman. Or, or, um, and so the accountability for a claiming of the depressive position, that's about holding, that's a different moral achievement, I think. That's a different, so I think that we're all the time um, listening to people, encouraging them to be truthful, to not edit their thoughts, to be brave enough to reveal themselves. And then it's also about owning their an authentic act of self-revelation um, and choosing who, and this is more what I'll talk about tomorrow, but choosing our, um, who we, ourselves as subjects. Once we're free from some of the over-determined aspects that determine us, as we claim our agency, then we have more degrees of freedom to choose. Thank you. Um, so that's a very long response. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, so thank you much. very much. Okay, comments, questions, thoughts? Why well, always have, oh yes, please go ahead. Um, first of all, thank, thanks for the book and the title and the spirit of it, which I think picks up, in some ways connects with um, the, the uh, contribution of Sabina Schoenrein to analysis, which of course was not at some point, but it feels like in some way you've got some of that. It, it certainly feels very feminine. Um, to then, then to the connection between um, sort of emerging uh, feminine spirit and masculine spirit in, in, in the political domain. If we think about the Bill of Rights, um, that those rights are negative. Um, the government shall not infringe on these things. And that's consistent with the tradition in English law of the emergence of the free man. And it was a man, free man, who is entitled to his property and his uh, earnings and his labor, and, and in certain ways, um, the king and the monarchy as it extends, and, and the government, may not infringe on that man's freedom in certain ways. So the Bill of Rights can be seen as an extension of that. Uh, so maybe, in some ways, the rebels in the USA were, uh, were continuing that process. When we think about some of the newer rights, right to education, right to health care, those are much more nurturing rights. And there is also a different economic implication, because there's very little economic implication in the, in the Bill of Rights, except that um, there has to be a judiciary to sort out the, the, the claims of infringement. But otherwise, the government is not asked to do anything in the Bill of Rights. Um, the government is asked to do a lot if we have a right to health care, if we have a right to education. There's a whole economic infrastructure uh, that has to, an, an administrative infra infrastructure that has to be set up. Might that be an instantiation 